Good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and what an honor it is to have as our guest this morning, Dr. Ron Paul. What can we say about Ron Paul, the leader of freedom, not only in the United States, but all over the world? Millions of young people, and some of us older than young people, look to him for clarity and the truth in all kinds of areas involving economics, war and peace, the role of government, the economy, what the Fed is doing, and just 101 different areas. But Ron, I wanted to start off today to talk about sequestration. I mean, if we listen to the the media, which impresses me as sort of a a Soviet media in the way they repeat this kind of stuff, why uh, the world might come to an end if there's a cut in the projected spending increases for the government. Yes. And, you know, there's been statistics out, and, and nobody seems to agree on them. But I think on principle, those of us who want honesty realize that there are no cuts. And this, this whole idea that there's going to be a slashing in the budget is nothing more than a farce. The one side wants to increase the budget over the next 10 years by $2.5 trillion. The other side wants to increase it at $2.4 trillion. So it's a hundred hundred billion dollar cut over 10 years. And they're hysterical over the whole thing. The frenzy is just built, you know, with the media and the demagoguing and everybody who wants to spend. And then the so-called conservatives on the Republican side, you know darn well, they won't cut one penny out of the military. It's just amazing how far this can go. But uh, I think in one way, you might look for more sanity in the marketplace. Not that that's the final test, but the markets aren't hysterical about this. On, on the short run, the markets are still saying, you know, the end of the world is not coming, and uh, it's a non-event. Long term, it's a big event, you know, the spending and the endless spending and all that. I understand that, but as far as the end of the week comes, it's not like everything is going to be slashed. I'm just amazed at how gullible the people are, but hopefully we'll get to a lot more than we have over the years. and. That's where I am optimistic that more people are opening up their eyes and their ears. I noticed that Obama's making a trip to Israel where, of course, Netanyahu will be demanding that the U.S. attack Iran. But does it seem to you that that's maybe slightly less likely than it used to be, or is it more likely, or what do you see happening there? You know, I think it's less likely, and it it might be just the the economics of it all. You know, uh, although there aren't any real cuts, people actually realize that this isn't going to last forever. So I've always argued that uh, we'll quit the, the nonsense overseas, not because we have wised up and we have wise leaders, but because we won't be able to afford it. So I think right now, I, I would say uh, it's less likely than it had been, you, you know, in the past. Let's hope we move in that direction, but uh, they're still a powerful influence by the neoconservatives. They're still ranting and, and raving about Hegel being, you know, appointed Secretary of Defense. But that in itself isn't going to make a lot of difference. The spending is going to continue. There's still going to be an influence. But the answer, I would say, is I think it's a little less likely now that uh, they're about to because I think they they know they can't really afford it nor run it. Uh, I I think that uh, our capabilities, you know, just aren't there because the type of war that would have to be fought is completely different than building more F-35s. You know, I think think, this is one thing I hopefully can write something on this is they talk about all this budgeting, but then when you look at the F-35, I saw the other day, and it, literally, if it, if, if it lasted through its theoretical lifespan, it would be $1.5 trillion, according to the Pentagon, that it would cost to run these airplanes that have no use. And then they wonder, how can we ever slash, you know, this this defense? Of course, there is no defense. This is just militarism at its worst. I think that uh, everybody should uh, refresh your memory about the warning that Eisenhower gave us about building weapons like this and then worrying about the budget. Uh, I, I, I really get upset with conservatives who consider themselves free market people and condemn the liberals for Keynesian economics at the same time. Well, you can't cut the F-35 because there are 40 some states that make parts and it would hurt huh. hurt those jobs so it's uh, it's rather disgusting uh, on on how they look at it and pretend that they're free market people Ron, i noticed that uh, obama opened up a new drone base in uh, niger uh, the other day and the us i guess has expanded 
its military footprint in, what, 35 countries in Africa, some huge number of countries. So that's going on, even though they may be pulling back a little bit from uh, wanting to murder everybody in Iran. Yeah, they're just moving about, and they're moving further east, you know, in, into the Pacific, the Philippines, and getting more likely involved in a squabble between Japan and, and China. They're certainly not giving up. But, you know, you'd think we'd, we'd learn a lesson or be totally embarrassed that we use, we're going bankrupt, and we're going over there. We have plans to get more involved in 35 countries in Africa because we have to protect our natural resources. We live in the old age of mercantilism, and we think that we have to have our military to protect the supplies of natural resources. Well, of course, that's what we've been doing in the Middle East as well. But who who annoys us the most at the official level? Oh, it's the Chinese. They have a, a, a weak currency. Oh, yeah, Americans have a real strong currency, <laughs> you know, with zero interest rates, and they get away with economic murder in the sense that they can pass this stuff out and the people still take it. So the Chinese, they work hard and they save their money and they invest in these countries. So they're over there investing in Africa, investing in Iran and in these different places. I mean, before you know it, they could become more capitalistic than we are at the rate we're going. It doesn't make any sense uh, for us to uh, think that we're an exceptional nation and that we have this obligation to use force to promote our goodness around the world, and, and we're not even in good capitalists anymore. So it's uh, it's a sad story, but fortunately, there's a lot of people waking up due to the work the Mises Institute's doing, due to the interest that the young people have. So uh, I do believe we uh, live in transitional times, revolutionary times, where these views are changing. And the best news, as far as I'm concerned, and I hope I'm right, is Keynesianism isn't dead, but it's dying quickly on the vine, and it has to be replaced by something. Well, there's no question. I mean, you've you've attracted, I think, millions of young people around the world uh, to question Keynesianism, to be interested in Austrian economics, to question the role of the Fed. And, and right now... Uh, there's a little bit of debate about this alleged exit strategy where the Fed would stop uh, keeping interest rates near zero. Is there a little bit of dissent within the Fed? I mean, what's what about the markets? How are people on Wall Street and in the, the banking system, as we, of course, know the Fed exists to, to promote them especially, as well as the government? But what's happening in those areas? Yeah, I think there's a little more dissent because they realize uh, you know, how insane the policy is and you can't go on forever. But I don't believe that anybody has any clout except Bernanke and what he says counts. So, and a lot of people ask me about, well, you know, they just get their directions all conspiracy and they're going to do this to create chaos and buy up the world. And I see it slightly differently. I think the Bernankes of the world are very similar to the Paul Krugmans of the world. They they believe this stuff. <laughs> you know, they they really truly believe that they can print money forever and and for it to work because it's in in a in a way they've survived it you know since uh, the breakdown of Bretton Woods with a lot of ups and downs so they don't they believe they can pull this out again and if if things don't do well they just print more and more so I think the dissent is outside I don't think the other members of the board have much to do about it but I think a few who are absolute Keynesians in that they can uh, regulate the economy through central economic planning and monetary policy. See, they're still very much in charge, but I, I think the reality of the economy will stop them, not because all of a sudden we're going to get a uh, a wise Federal Reserve Board chairman or that Bernanke is going to say that we have to wind down because he must know. He cannot be naive enough to think that he can start withdrawing some of those funds or even slow up on buying some of these things. $85 billion a month they buy you know, with mortgage security and treasury security. If they just slow up, it's going to panic uh, the, the whole country. It's an addiction, and they can't live without it. The patient, which is the economy, is is is, is going to collapse, and, and the, they're not going to save the patient. And I've often used the analogy with drugs. A, a drug act, a addict or an alcoholic, they don't like to leave that stuff. And uh, the political alcoholic is... Uh, is is much more difficult to treat than uh, an ordinary alcoholic. Uh, at least some of them can finally get the motivation to get off that stuff. 
Ron, you've been the pioneer in asking uh, what gold is there in Fort Knox, what gold is there in the, in the vaults of the New York Fed, and who owns it? Are you encouraged by the fact that this, this seems to be an international movement now of people in Germany forcing the German government to ask for some of their gold back? And in Mexico, Austria, many other countries asking uh, not to have the Bank of England or especially the, the New York Fed hold their gold. Do you think we'll ever get an audit of what's exactly there and who, and who owns it? Probably indirectly. You know, if the Germans want their gold and they, and they can't get it back, then that will be the the audit that will count. I don't think <laughs> right. I don't think the politicians <laughs> will actually do it. I heard somebody on the business station this week, and he was talking about you know this this whole whole mess. He he was claiming that you know it will come to an end. And here he was he was the defending it, but he was making fun. He says the central banks people were arguing. Well, the central banks are actually buying gold at this terrible time. And he compared it, interestingly enough, he was compared to the stupidity of the Bank of, of England buying, uh, selling gold when it was $250 an ounce. So now because there are some central banks buying gold, which are actually in the Far East, and I don't think they're stupid. I don't, I, I think for them, Russia and these other countries buying gold and, and putting it in a central bank. He said, well, they sold when it was too low, now they're buying when it's too high. But I guess time will tell which, which is correct but uh, you know fortunately the uh, the markets even work with tyrants you know there's always a market out there to tell us what's going on even in the soviet system they had they had the true market sometimes they call it a black market but it, there's always a market out there so i think that's what's going to happen with gold and you know how long uh, you actually helped me many years ago on trying to get an audit you even back with the gold commission you know and and they wouldn't even accept this so now, I don't think that's going to happen, but I, uh, I'm looking for the day when there'll be more foreign countries saying, hey, we want our gold back, and we do not know wh whether our gold has been committed, whether it's there or whatever. So uh, it'll probably take runaway inflation for us all to wake up. I'm assuming it's not a bunch of wooden bricks painted gold, but we'll, well, maybe we'll find <laughs> out someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. People said, why don't you go and look at it? What, what could be me walking down this corridor and looking at like, the gold? I mean, that's not an analysis. You know, it might be entertaining, but, but you to have a true analysis, uh, it's going to be a lot different than the commitments. You know, has the gold been loaned up? Who actually has ownership? And, uh, of course, but, you know, we shouldn't worry about this, Lou. I mean, we we have been assured by the top money guy that gold is not money, so why do we really care about this? This is just a useless commodity if we had the true marketplace. Remember, it was going to go down to $5 an ounce. No, it's just a barbarous relic, as uh, Keynes yeah. like to like to pretend, you know, pretend to give us a judgment. Right. Ron, I noticed somebody the other day, and I think this is probably typical of the mainstream media, uh, referred to you as retired. Now, maybe they're just mistaken, or maybe they're attempting to uh, do damage. But of course, not only are you not retired, it seems to me you've stepped up your work, thank goodness, uh, since you left Congress. You've retired from the world of politics, but you're not retired. You've got this new uh, radio show you're doing with Charles Goyette. You've got your website that you're building, uh, you're going to continue working in the areas that are that you've always worked in, whether it's questions of war and peace or the Federal Reserve and all other related areas. You're talking about and you're going to be working in uh, communications and reaching out to people in all kinds of new and different ways that accord with what young people are interested in, because they're not interested in a lot of the, the, the dinosaur media. They're interested in the new media. You have a special, you've always had a special connection to young people. So I, I must say I'm opposed to retirement anyway. It's an invention of Bismarck and FDR and I think economically and in every other way a bad idea. But you're not retired. You're working a lot harder. You're working longer days <laughs> than we, when you were in Congress. The opportunities are fantastic. I, I'd never believe they would be so much uh, so much available that I could do. But, you know, I don't think the word retired, I think they got mixed up. They must have misheard. I think it was tired of D.C., not retired. <laughs> yeah. So uh, even though I, I do go back and forth on occasion, especially uh, going to go, on to, uh, go to George Washington University, so I will go into that area for special reasons. But, uh, yes, I was sort of tired of it. But the opportunity 
this is what is fascinating me, how much has been available. There's so many opportunities I can't even take advantage of them all, but uh, it allows me to do the things that I had been trying to do for so many years, but it's more or less on my time and my picking and choosing. And like I've told so many people at the speeches that I give, I guess, to reassure myself as well, if we're doing this and it's not a labor of love, it's not much fun. If it's not much fun, why even do it? And I enjoy it, and I think it's important. I get satisfaction from it, and I'm sure you've had the same experience keeping the Mises Institute going, getting the satisfaction of seeing so much good come from it. So I, I look forward to all the opportunities, and I'm going to enjoy it. Well, you are, and of course, you're continuing to be very much in demand on college campuses. You're writing books, and there's an exciting era of uh, a new era of Ron Paul coming up for all the people who follow you. So, uh, folks, wait for the big announcements. Thank you, Ron, very much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Lou. Bye bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts, there have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the upper right-hand corner of the LRC front page. Thank you.